am at season 7. Why are you still good? I'm so confused by this. Even Sci-Fi Debris liked this episode, and he hates Voyager. I know, that's actually an exaggeration. <laughs> this is some good stuff. <clears throat> I really like this episode. <sighs> Even though it does one thing that makes me eye roll a little bit. J just a little bit. <clears throat> I do want to give praise to the special effects team in this episode. I know that's a weird thing to start with, but it's a unique challenge and one that not everyone really appreciates to try and create a scene in a lightless environment. It, it's harder than you'd think to actually make that visible, but still get across the impression of it being dark. And there's a, there's a few tricks and tips you can do to do that. I actually recently talked about that when it came to Kingdom Hearts 2.8. But they do a very good job of it in this episode. Not with the, not just with the void and the outs, external shots of the ships, but the internal shots as well. Some very well done stuff. So definite props there. Um, so much of this episode nails the same point that I almost feel weird going down in order. But I'm going to go ahead and do that in this case because I think it's the best way to really make my point here. First, let's start with Seven. Just a little bit of character development for her and the fact that she's getting into her own particular form of creative expression. Uh, she's actually dabbled in that briefly, like years ago, I think, at this point. But this is kind of a unique form of creative expression that I think suits her very well. It's kind of like being an architect. I've actually talked about this before. I think Zevin would make a good tasser. <laughs> uh, it's it's like crafting the plans for a beautiful masterpiece of, of a building or, or a bridge or what have you, rather than, say, doing like a performance art, like dancing or something like that. They're both creative. They're just different types of creative. And I think the former, the more constructing, uh, planning sort of creation is the kind of thing that would suit Seven very well. I also like the fact that she gets defensive. No, I mean that sincerely. Not only is it very in keeping with most people who have first started something, you know, you first start drawing, you first start writing, you first start acting, and then people get a little bit, you know, well, you're not that great because you're not, <laughs> because you just started. And people tend to get a little bit defensive about that because, you know, they're, it, it, duh, right? They're still amateurs. They're still figuring out. But the other thing I like about that is that it shows that Seven cares. You don't get defensive unless you care about what you're defending. And she obviously cares about being a good cook and cares about putting this forth properly. And the way she reacts to Tom, clearly, I have done this horribly wrong, and then immediately turns that around and, like, attacks him. Maybe you would prefer a peanut butter and jelly sandwich instead. Implying, rather passive-aggressively, actually, that he has no taste. It's the kind of thing that would be churlish if someone else did it, but in the case of Seven, it's just an indicative of her starting to... to become a little more accustomed to such societal norms. Um, I'm going to skip over most of my notes here. I, I want to hammer in some points, and I'm going to try and cluster them together. So, deuterium. Uh, I like the fact that deuterium is kind of a plot point in this episode for arguably the first time when it should have been. For those of you not aware, deuterium is extremely common. Uh, in the galaxy, and in fact, several episodes before now in Voyager have made it a plot point that deuterium is super rare, and we're so we're having so much issue getting a hold of it. This is despite the fact that deuterium again is a very common, easily accessible thing, and even this episode flat out says, "Why would they try to get deuterium? You can get that anywhere." I like that because not only does it make sense, but in the context of just this episode, it makes a point very clearly. It says, even the most common substance is still very rare here, and thus very valuable. If this was set in a non-science fiction setting, it would probably be water. The idea of you, you know, having limited supplies of water being a rare and valuable resource, despite the fact that a normal human being would view water as not even a resource, which I'm not even going to get into that. Robin Sox, rest in peace, was in this episode. And he's awesome, as he always is. I don't have much to share about him, uh, other than two, excuse me, three quick things. First of all, I find it interesting how intelligently he's portrayed throughout. It would have been easy to make him a <laughs> kind of a pirate, 
Yar, matey, and just constantly, ha ha, I'll take stuff because I will, cacklingly, stupidly evil with no characterization. And yet we see in him, and at least part of this is probably due to the actor's performance, someone who clearly is not, or I should say, was not a pirate at heart, and has been forced to do terrible things to survive, and has just kind of gotten used to that, to the point where they have been so ground down that the idea of doing anything else is kind of alien to him. And, uh... I find that interesting because it wouldn't surprise me all that much if he was someone who would have actually joined that alliance if he had been approached on the matter. Obviously he wasn't because he needed to serve as antagonist, but still. He also presents the obvious perspective, just like the crew do, actually. See, of course the crew is first going to think, we gotta get out of, we got to figure out how to escape, just like anyone would. Thing is, in more ways than one, the crew of Voyager are not your average crew. They are not your average starship. Voyager itself is a very advanced ship, which has very advanced tech and very advanced crew with some modifications that make it very, very, very advanced. In fact, I like it how the very next scene shows how using Borg technology allows them to map the plane within minutes, even though previously, they, as they're talking to someone who's been there for five years, hadn't been able to map it. It's not stated outright, but it showcases that the Voyager crew has a point, that they are something new to the equation, and that that should be taken into consideration. However, it's also very understandable, Valen's perspective. The fact that Valen is looking at the situation like, there's no, no, you're not getting out. If you had been trapped somewhere for five years... I'm pretty sure you would stop thinking about escape after a certain point, too. It would get to the point where it's just like, yeah, that's, it's not happening. At some point or another, you just kind of give up and give in to the... Not despair. That's not the word. The inevitability, the futility of the situation. There's no point in trying to get out. And so the only thing we can do is survive. Or die. We survive or we die! Oh, sorry. Sorry, Mass Effect reference. Sorry. <laughs> Speaking of Mass Effect reference, Robin Sachs, I already mentioned that. Uh, several deliberate nods to Babylon 5 in this episode, if you didn't catch that. I mentioned that because those were deliberate. Uh, just thought I'd mention it as an aside. I don't have much to share about it, but I do have one other thing to share about it really quick. So, Robin Sox's character, uh, Valen, has a line. Moral I wrote it down. Morality won't keep your life support systems running. It's a great line. Because it's absolutely true, but it's also a simple truth, not a complex one. Because morality isn't what's actually on the line here. I'll talk more about that later, but keep that in the back of your mind. This episode is not actually about morality. Not really. Um, so then they say, well, we've got one shot. So naturally they say, screw testing, let's just try it now. There's a tactical reason to do that, but it was stupid, and it was very in character for Janeway. Now, I mentioned that. Let's talk about Janeway briefly. Obviously, Janeway's kind of a divisive character. I personally do like Janeway, as I think I just said last episode, but a lot of that boils down to Kate Mulgrew and to her interpretation of her in inconsistently written character. Because... As I've said before, a lot of different writers took the character in different directions, so the real problem, and I've said this before, the real problem with Captain Janeway is there is no Captain Janeway. There is no one character. It's like saying Batman. We may have things that we may consider to be Batman, but that's what you consider to be Batman, or what he considers to be Batman, or what she considers to be Batman. There is no one Batman character, and there hasn't been for a long time. <coughs> Excuse me. Hmm. So there's no one Janeway, and that's one of the problems with the character. That's actually probably, I'd say, the biggest problem with the character. But it is very in keeping with the Mulgrew interpretation of the character. <coughs> Excuse me, just a second. Which is as someone who is not a strong leader, who is trying to be a strong leader, to do something like, say... Well, we only have one choice. We need to make it right now and rush it as quickly as possible rather than doing testing and making sure we have the best possible chance when we make our one chance. 
Similarly, shortly thereafter, this Janeway goes to the Starfleet Charter for guidance. Okay? And she flat out says she was looking for a loophole. <laughs> First of all, that's like looking into the Constitution for guidance. Um, if you don't understand what I mean by that, the Constitution is not actually the form of government. It is supposed to be the most bare-bones undercurrent that the government is built on top of. It's like, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not the thing you go to, is what I'm trying to say. But more to the point, <clears throat> more to the point, the fact that she wanted to go to a legal document written by strangers centuries ago in order to give her permission to ignore her morality is very Janeway. And again, not something a strong leader would do. See, I mentioned this earlier. Janeway's dilemma is not actually that of morality. It is that of method of existence. It has been shown time and time again in real life, and, and in fiction, it tends to follow this path as well, that when you really boil it down, there are two methods of existence. You can parasite, or you can cooperate. I'm, I'm using incorrect terms. I should say parasite or symbiose. In other words, you take and therefore supply to yourself, or you cooperate with and supply for both of you. Those are the two methods of existence. This is true on an animal level, on an insect level, on a bacterial level, and on a sentient sapient species level. That's what this dilemma is really about. Now, most of the people within this void, quite logically, choose a parasitic pers perspective. They take, they pirate, they kill, they steal. Interesting thing, though. Even early on, we see that that's not the only perspective. Remember, Valen approaches her and communicates. It's like, hey, so let's talk. Even early on, we see the possibilities, the seed of the, the ideas of cooperation rather than simply trying to attack and take. Now, that's because Voyager vastly outweighs Valen's ship. By the way credit for the episode for like one of the first episodes in a very long time to really showcase that Voyager is actually a good damn ship in combat it's been, it took forever to get there but we're finally there but it also showcases the obvious benefits of doing so the only thing that shuts it down is the fact that her Janeway's sense of morality rubs up against his probably reminds him of all the terrible crap he's had to do to survive which certainly isn't something he consider a positive and then, of course, her refusal to actually agree to his terms. I'm not trading you weapons. Here's the thing. A long time ago, there was an episode called Alliance, which I hate. And I actually, I, I, somewhat recently, by my perspective, this is going to be like a month ago by your perspective, but somewhat recently by my perspective, I just uh, had a comment that it summarized my thoughts perfectly. It was like, Alliance was a great episode until like it hit the final act, and then it just tumbled down the hill, getting worse and worse and worse until the final sanctimonious speech by Janeway, and then I just ended on such a sour note that on repeat viewings, I usually skip it because I hate that episode because of that final act. It ruined the rest of the episode for me. And to this day, I consider Alliance one of the more negative episodes of Voyager because of that final act. This is what Alliances should have been. Let's talk about the Void. The Void is absolutely fascinating from a narrative perspective. It's so fascinating, I will probably go ahead and try to use it, or something like it, I should clarify. You know, the idea of the Void in some of my own fictional works, because it's just such a great idea. This is a place that produces nothing. There is zero natural resources. So even the most basic things, like water, or air, or deuterium, are suddenly finite resources, very finite. And all, and just basic things like energy or functionality and even the tech not working the same, right? However, things can be brought into the void, but things cannot leave the void. And so we have the political realities of what would happen in a situation. This is the kind of thing that I would love to sit in a room with like 10 players. 
lay out the situation for them and say, all right, you're stuck in this place. What do you do? Because I guarantee you some players would immediately start to think of attacking weaker players to take their stuff, to survive off of, to strengthen themselves. Some players would unify. Some players would try to make temporary alliances and then betray them. The level of politics would be fascinating to perceive. And we do see hints and bits and pieces of that throughout the episode. Furthermore, of course, taking stuff, the parasite uh, perspective I showed earlier, is the easiest and most obvious way to sustain oneself in this environment. You can't get out. Well, it took quite a bit to get out, so I think we can fairly easily say that it is not easy to get out, and that's the truth of the nature. And therefore, you're stuck here, so your options are to, to kill or to die. So you sit around doing whatever it is you do in your daily life, waiting and watching in this hellish existence for someone new to be tossed in. And then you immediately try to jump on them and take their stuff as quickly as possible. We even see in the first bit, before we even understand the realities of what happened to a Voyager, that they're attacked by one ship, which is driven off by a second ship who wants their stuff for themselves. And it's only Valen's ship, the intelligent one, who sat back and watched, trying to figure out, you know, what, how should I interact with this one, rather than jumping like a slavering mad dog in the latest bone that's been tossed in. Speaking of which, this place feels a lot like a prison, doesn't it? Think about it for a moment. This is the kind of place I could see someone engineering as an imprisonment, as a form of punishment, and just kind of leaving it to its own devices, because honestly, at this point, <laughs> what are they going to do, you know? I like that idea. I might do that. Anyways, the reality, of course, is that without procuring new resources from outside the void, existence is not possible. And yet the episode makes it clear, again, even early on, even before Janeway gets her idea, that the only way to do that is not simply by taking, but it is possible to cooperate, to trade, to reach out a hand of friendship, because friendship, too often we think of friendship as meaning, ah, we're all together in one big happy family. And that is certainly true in some respects. But when it comes to organizations, when it comes to nations, which is effectively what these ships are, each ship, as of the moment they enter the void, is effectively one little nation, all on its own. And the way they interact with the other ships is on a national level. It's actually a brilliant parallel because I know it, this, the episode kind of hits you over the head with this, but this episode is the Federation. In fact, the working title for this episode was Federation. This episode is a microcosm of Voyager's overall premise, but also of the Federation itself. And the best part is Fantome. Hear me out. So, first of all, Fantome is played by the gentleman who played Hugh over in Iborg. I don't know if you remember that uh, episode, but it's a good episode. You should watch it. It's in TNG. He does, his, he does some good stuff. He Very good visual acting with his movements and his posture. I like it. But he does a really good job, and I think it's absolutely ruddy brilliant, the idea of musical tones as a, link, as a means of communicating with a species that you do not understand the language of. That is actually so many levels of brilliant, I'm surprised nothing else that I have personally seen in Star Trek has ever done something like that. It's a great way of establishing a mutual understanding. This tone means this, this tone means this, and it, it basically from there you do the building blocks of forming a language, and then the concepts of tone and linguistics and all that fun stuff. And then the fact that the doctor, who himself is a computer program quick enough to be able to keep up with that kind of thing, matches it and is able to literally talk with them is brilliant. I really do like that. I agree with Tuvok. He, it, is, it, is a, it is an incredible idea. Um, but the, uh, the, the reason Fantome's people, who are never named, are so brilliant for the course of this episode and why they had to be included is because they are the episode in a nutshell. The Voyager crew comes across an individual who is hurt and hungry and with no desire towards themselves. There's nothing Voyager's getting out of this. They are bleeding resources off to someone for nothing other than kindness. And in so doing, that person starts to grow and learn and interact with us. Now we understand each other more. Now we learn more about each other. We help more of his people. And in the end, they turn around and offer to help us. 
That is, in many ways, the basic precepts of cooperative symbiotic relationships, that method of existence. And I love that it came across so naturally that you probably didn't even notice it being slid under the rug amidst all the other more obvious correlations to the Federation within this episode. And there's a brilliant scene where Janeway pretty much calls it out flat out. She says to Seven, what you did was extremely inefficient and did not help this crew. From a purely logical perspective, what you did is wrong, Seven, because Seven is more valuable than that random person. But she did it. And that is the Federation in a nutshell. They're kind of like root beer. <laughs> Sorry. I love that. Because the whole episode is about the, you know, the whole principles thing. It really isn't about morality. Janeway is constantly pushing the morality line. But that's not what this is about. As I think I've already highlighted. There's a scene where she gets really pissed off at Bob. Did I write down his name? No, I didn't. Uh, Bob. <laughs> the alien guy. And she takes this stance saying, No, what you did was wrong. Be gone from my Federation. And yet, she does that for purely moral reasons. She does that because it offends her principles. But what she does is the right thing to do. Not because of her principles. Not because of morality. But because of the reality of what cooperation versus non-cooperation, what parasitism versus symbiosis means. Because if she allows or passively encourages members of her alliance to break the fundamental tenant of that alliance, you could see how it would not only drift apart, but worse, might actually become a new, par a, over, a larger parasitic entity in its own right. The Federation becoming an empire, if you will. And so, what she did was correct. Just not from a moral perspective. Whether it was morally correct or not, that's that's something that's debatable, because by, by definition, morals are not defined. <sighs> um... I like Neelix in this episode. He does. He actually does a great scene with the Nigeans. Nigeans, excuse me, uh, where he tells them, you know, I'm actually the first member of this alliance, which is not only true, but also is pretty much the exact correct thing that needed to be said. I've been a member of this crew for six years, and I have yet to be misused or abused or had that trust thing. You know, blah blah blah. Basically, I'm vouching for these people, and that's the kind of thing that you need to hear in that. I also appreciate the usage of seesaw effect in this episode, because it's always really difficult to start something. I mean, that's just logic. I mean, hell, that's physics, actually. It is harder to start than to keep going. Momentum is a thing not just for physical interactions, but societal ones, mental ones, emotional ones. So, once they get the first member of the Alliance to join up, other members are easier to convince. Because, and it's so obvious, what's more convincing? Join us! Who else is with you? Well, it's just me. Or, join us! There's three of us. And then, of course, that's why it's called Seesaw, because it gets easier as it goes on. Join us! There's ten of us. At a certain point, even if it's not intended as a threat, some people would try to join up the Alliance just because the Alliance is a threat. They would perceive it as one, and rightfully so. Now, I've done a lot of praise for this episode, so i got to point something out. <clears throat> the idea that Fantome's people are native to the Void is so stupid that I, I, I don't even have the ability to properly dissect it. The idea that a native species was created or born or evolved in a place that has nothing, including light, is ridiculous on bordering on stupid. Also, keeping in mind, they, knew to, they do need to be on a ship, as is demonstrated many times. They don't just float around in the void. That being said, I think that's more on Janeway. Uh, 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 so I was prepared to rant about that. Um, but when I rewatched the episode this time, I noticed that they never actually say that definitively. It's more along the lines of the fact that I'm pretty sure the Fantomes people were one of the people who came here on one of the ships and just kind of adapted to being here. What I want to know is how they get around on the ships. They don't have transporters. It's another one of the questions. But like I said, Fantomes people do serve a very strong thematic purpose to the episode, so I'm willing to forgive it. 
what else? I've got other things. Yes, I've got another thing to talk about. You remember Kess? You might, you might not. It's okay. She's a while ago. Um, Kess had a great speech to the doc, to the deranged doc in The Darkling, which is an episode that was otherwise kind of unremarkable, but the way she convinced him was brilliant. I talked about it then. I'm not going to rehash it now. But I like it because this episode in many ways calls back to that. The idea that by unifying we can accomplish more. See, throughout all this episode they talk about the morality of things and how we'll be you know, killing and stealing and maybe we should violate our principles. And again, this is much more strong of a case than Alliance's was because in this case it's violating your principles in a horrible way, but also if you don't, it's a horrible end. Much more extreme, making the question much more prominent. It's easier to compromise your principles if you'll die if you don't. You know? So, the whole episode builds on this point, with, with Janeway's interaction with Seven, with the Doctor's interactions with the uh, Fantomes people, with Jane, with the Nigeans, and, and the... Uh, the hierarchy are a great example of this. By the way, I do like how they're spying on their allies. I know that sounds weird, but A, it makes perfect sense. Remember, spy networks are actually a critical component of peace. A lot of people tend to think of spies as dirty, underhanded, terrible things that lead to war, but reality has shown pretty much the exact frickin' opposite. One of the strongest proponents of two different nations, remember, each ship is functioning as a nation, is that you know what the other one's doing. And they know that you know what you're doing, and blah, 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 blah. And this kind of smooths things out a bit, because in the absence of information, we can only speculate. And logically speaking, when you're thinking as a national level, you should speculate at the worst. As in, worst possible scenario, and then kind of pull it back a little bit, because worst possible scenario probably isn't happening. But you should still be thinking, okay, I need to be prepped for something bad. Spying helps prevent you from thinking, oh god, what are they doing? But instead you spy and it's like, okay, they're doing this. I can deal with that. See, Valen and his concept, it, it's, it's great. The, the guy goes to Valen's ship and forms a new alliance. It's fantastic. I'm telling you, Valen would have joined the alliance if they asked him to. But of course there's that old morality stance that Janeway keeps pushing. I'm not saying she's right or wrong, by the way. I'm just saying that's not the point. Janeway realizes the truth about halfway through the episode, that the possibility of an alliance within the Void is possible through the basic principles of what the Federation is. Just like Kess's speech back in the Darkling, the mutual cooperation of similar entities towards mutual benefit, symbiosis, that method of existence. And she realizes this because the, at this point it becomes more than mere existence. And that, I think, is the strongest part of the episode. Because Valen and, and his ilk are content to exist, to survive within the void, and to take and to steal. But that's not what the Alliance is after. The literal thing the Alliance is after is getting the hell out of the void. But think about it from a thematic perspective. Think about what they're doing. What they're doing is saying, I can exist, or I can dare to live. That I can try to live. That I can reach out and do something more than just sit around and accept food, air, water, and a meaningless, pointless existence. The very foundation of this episode is about that drive towards cooperative effort for a better end. Something more than just being. And I love that. Because that in many ways is what Star Trek is about for me, personally. I'm reminded of Shattered, which we recently covered, which had a similar theme undercurrent within it. By the way, I hope you noticed it, but they actually play some bits of the original series theme at certain points in this episode, at two points that I caught. Kind of fitting, don't you think? Next week, well, I'm not sure if we're going to do it in one episode or two, but next week we start Workforce. Another great episode! What the hell, Voyager? <laughs> At least there's no construction crew right outside my door this time. I'll see you guys next time.